I will talk to you uh, today about the tree of life, um, the diversity of life on Earth, uh, and what we understand of the relationships of a uh, living being on Earth, uh, and specifically uh, about the origin of complex life. So classifying life uh, is a very old problem, uh, obviously, Humans have observed that the life on Earth was very diverse, even if we're just talking about the microbi microbial life, so animals and plants. Um, and there is an entire science that is about classifying organisms. Uh, taxonomy is the study of scientific classification, uh, and in particular, the classification of living organisms. Uh, according to some system that we assume is uh, about their natural relationships. The first, uh, the first to propose to try to come up with such a classification uh, was Aristotle. Uh, so he tried to classify uh, all kinds of animals uh, and he proposed this, this view that I'm showing here, uh, which was a very uh, hierarchical view. Uh, that was classifying organisms uh, or creatures uh, in order from the lowest to the highest and humans being of course at the top of this classification. Uh, one thing that's very important to keep in mind was that in this classification there was no, this was a fixed uh, classification, there was no concept of evolution uh, and there was no specific relationship between the different classes of organisms. Uh, the organisms had an essence that was fixed and unchanged and unchangeable. So we're doing a, a really a big leap, leap uh, forward uh, and with the uh, work of Linnaeus. So Linnaeus uh, was a Swedish scientist and he uh, came up with a new classification. So composed of three kingdoms. Um, so this classification contained plants, animals, but also rocks. Uh, this was part of the classification of the natural world. Uh, and he came up with um, a system to classify organisms that is basically uh, the one that we still use today uh, with these seven uh, ranks of in the classification that are displayed here. Uh, and if you're familiar with the genus species system, this is still the system that we use today and this is what he invented. So this is what we call the uh, bin binomial uh, nomenclature. Uh, and so here I just depicted the, his coat of arms. So he got a coat of arms that had three colors on it and each of them representing so animals, plants and rocks. Of course, so those classifications, well, they were all about what we could observe with the naked eye. Uh, and once we discovered microbes, of course, those classifications uh, became different. Uh, and we owe this to Anthony uh, uh, van Leeuwenhoek, who is considered to be the father of microbiology. He was a Dutch uh, businessman and scientist, and he invented the first microscope. Uh, and so he invented this, uh, yeah, this first microscope and started observing everything he could around him, uh, taking samples from ponds or from um, everything he could find. And so he observed muscle fibers, uh, bacteria, even if at the time we didn't know what bacteria were, uh, um, sperm cells, red blood cells. And he called, so he made descriptions of those and he called all of them uh, animal cults, so little animals. And so you might be familiar with this, but really the sort of the shift in how we're thinking about classification and how we're, um, yeah, how we're thinking about the relationship between different organisms changed dramatically with Charles uh, Darwin. Uh, so Darwin was uh, the first time to propose that all existing uh, living organisms are connected, uh, have an evolutionary um, connection and a relationship and that all current species uh, have descended from a common ancestor uh, and that we can represent this through a tree uh, that represents yes the, the the connection the relationships the family tree in a way of all living uh, beings on earth uh, so however so he proposed this concept but he didn't actually propose uh, a tree with 
existing, like real species. He just proposed the concept of species being connected to one another. Uh, Haeckel was the first one to propose so such a tree with like all known species at the time. Uh, he was a German, uh, German scientist uh, and he proposed this. He was really at the, um, at the origin of a lot of terms in biology that are still used today. So uh, ecology, phylogeny, so phylogeny being the, the relationships between species, uh, stem cell, uh, and other words that we're still used today. And uh, so he, he did this mapping of uh, the connections, the relationships between uh, all life forms uh, onto a tree. And so this is what is uh, that you can see here. And in Haeckel's tree, we had three main kingdoms. Uh, so we had the plants, uh, animals as expected, and now a third kingdom that he called protista or protist. Um, one thing that I want to bring your attention to is that uh, those groups, so those words, we still use them today. They don't, but they don't, they didn't quite mean the same thing at the time. Um, so for example, uh, in plants, uh, we could find fungi. So uh, fungi were considered uh, vegetal, vegetal life, uh, so plants, uh, but we, we could also find in this domain of life uh, bacteria that were the photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, whereas in protists, uh, you had basically everything that is, or almost everything that is microbial. So whether uh, they are most of the other bacteria, uh, but also uh, unicellular uh, eukaryotes. So we're going to come back to this. Uh, and also uh, sponges, so which are animals, but uh, there are microbial uh, forms of those that were considered protists. Uh, Edouard Chaton was a, a French uh, biologist, and he's the one who proposed a term uh, to, who made, made the observation that there are really two main classes of cells on Earth. So you have cells that have a nucleus, so the DNA, everything, yeah, the DNA of the cell is encompassed in a membrane inside the cell, so inside a nucleus. Um, so this is what we call eukaryotes, so kari means uh, nucleus, so eukaryotes, so with a real nucleus, uh, whereas all the other cells are called prokaryotes, so they don't have a nucleus. Um, and uh, eukaryotes so have this nucleus, but also uh, are in general much more complex cells, and they have also intracellular uh, other compartments inside the cell uh, that divides the different processes. And this really, uh, this became one of the, this became to be recognized as one of the main uh, dichotomy uh, in life, uh, in life on Earth. So after this, this, uh, so this recognition modified a little bit the way we were thinking about the tree of life. Um, and in this tree, so now we're, uh, we're becoming closer to our time. So in 1969, uh, Whitaker proposed this tree uh, that we still find in some textbooks where we still, so we have uh, plants, uh, we now have fungi that are their own uh, kingdom now, we have animals, uh, but now we're separating, so we have protists, we still have this term, but now we took out the bacteria from protists, and uh, now bacteria are in this phylum that we're calling, uh, or this kingdom that we're calling Monera. Uh, so there was this recognition that, so Monera, so bacteria, prokaryotes are different types of cells than protista that have a nucleus, that are unicellular eukaryotes with a nucleus. Um, however, you can see on this tree that there is still uh, very much of a, an evolution, um, a hierarchical thinking about life where bacteria are represented at the bottom, uh, then you have uh, unicellular eukaryotes, and then you have complex life that is represented at the top. Uh, protists, so I've mentioned this term quite a few times now. 
So again, so for Heckel, protease was sort of a, um, a, an equivalent of microbial life. Uh, it encompassed both eukaryotic microbes and prokaryotic microbes. Today, this is not how we use this term anymore. Um, so here, this is a very schematic representation of what we know of the diversity of eukaryotes. Uh, so of all cell form, uh, life forms that have uh, cells with a nucleus. And what you can see on this tree is that, ev so everything that's not in the purple outline is multicellular. So you have animals uh, at the bottom right, you have fungi not too far from them, uh, and you have plants, uh, land plants at the top. Uh, so what you can see is that the very vast majority of eukaryotic life is actually unicellular. Uh, and that's what we talk about when we talk about protists. So we're talking about this very vast uh, and diverse group of unicellular eukaryotes. These scientists have proposed uh, different kinds of tree of life, of trees of life. Um, how do we come up with, how do we infer those relationships between living organisms? Well, the way we do this is that you need to have traits that are shared between the organisms that you're trying to connect and that you know have been inherited from a common ancestor. And those traits are what we call homologous traits. So they descend from a common ancestor and they diversified with time. Uh, and of course, they need to be in all of the organisms that you're trying to compare. So here, there's an example uh, that's very obvious. So if you're looking at vertebrates and you're looking at the, the, what would be the equivalent of the arm in different species, and you know there's bones that are similar between different species, and they all, they've been inherited from an ancestral vertebrate. And you can look at them and see which ones are more similar to one another and then assume that those uh, species are more closely related than a species that would have a very different type of arm, for example. Until the 1960s, uh, those traits, those homologous traits shared between species uh, were difficult to come by uh, in the sense that if you're trying to compare by morphology, an animal and a plant, or an animal and a mushroom, that's going to be very difficult, uh, or impossible, really. So because of this, because we only had access to the morphology of organisms, what people could do, what scientists could do, was to infer the relationships within clades, so for example, within vertebrates, or within specific uh, clades of plants by comparing, I don't know, petal, like the size, the shape of petals, uh, and so we came up with classifications for sub-branches of the tree of life, but not for uh, the tree of life as a whole. And this changed uh, dramatically with the access to molecular data. And so talking about molecular revolution is not an overstatement. Um, so this, so all cells, all living cells that we know, uh, have a lot of, well, have some universal homologies in how they function, how they encode uh, the genetic information and how this information is translate, like transcribed and translated uh, in the cell into proteins so that are doing the various functions in the cell. Uh, so there's a, a little scheme here. So all cells encode the information on DNA this DNA is transcribed uh, into RNA, and this RNA itself is translated in proteins. Um, and so all cells do this with a very similar mechanism. And to do this, to do, for, like, for example, the last step, so the translation of the RNA into proteins, uh, all cells will use uh, ribosomes, so those big structures, uh, they're big uh, protein structures, that are reading uh, the RNA uh, and translating this into different amino acids, so the building blocks of proteins. And all cells, all bacterial cells, all eukaryotic cells use to do this translation, they use the same dictionary, they use the same correspondence between uh, the, the letters that are on the RNA and what amino acid that corresponds to. 
And so this ribosome, uh, as I've just mentioned, so the ribosome is a really key structure uh, that, you can, that is responsible for this translation. It's found in all cells. And it's a, it's, so it's a, big, uh, it's a big complex that is composed of many proteins, but also of uh, RNA molecules that are embedded in those proteins. Um, and because this is something that you find in every single cell, uh, Carl Woos uh, had the idea of using this, basically this homologous character that you find in every cell, and to try to compare it between different organisms to infer how close they are from one another. So for this, he used one of the small one of the RNAs that is found in the ribosome. So this uh, RNA, uh, the ribosomal RNA, sm small subunit, because it's universal, and because it's so important for the cell that those are characters that tend to evolve to evolve quite slowly, which is good because if you're trying to compare uh, organisms that have diverged millions and billions of years ago, you want to have a character that is evolving quite slowly. Uh, and because it's such an important protein, uh, it's su such an important structure, it's also something that you find in very high abundance in the cells. So it's actually fairly easy to extract from any kind of cell that you would have uh, and to sequence it. So he, um, used uh, a technique that was um, developed by Fred Sanger uh, that uh, allowed for DNA the first DNA sequencing. And so how this worked, uh, so <laughs> this is a pretty ugly image by today's standards, but this was really revolutionary. Uh, so what they did here was to extract those RNA molecules that I just talked to you about that you can find in any kind of cell and then this molecule, so it's, it's a strain of RNA, so it's, it's letters, it's nucleotides, and you can use an enzyme that will recognize different, that like specific patterns and cut the molecule at wherever they find this pattern. Um, and so you can do this, and you will end up with different, like fragments of your, uh, of your RNA molecule uh, of different sizes, and RNA is charged, like that's a molecule that is uh, charged, and because it's charged, you can make it, you can migrate it on a, on a gel, we call it a gel. So you use current, and electrical current, and you can uh, make those molecules, those fragments migrate. And because those enzymes recognize specific patterns, and that the RNA is going to be a little bit different in every species. It's going to be similar, but not identical. Then those fragments are not going to be exactly the same in every species. So you're going to have different fragments, and when you make them migrate, you get this, um, those uh, gels with all the different fragments that you can observe on this gel. And this is what we call a catalog. And this catalog, is or fingerprint, is going to be specific to every species that you're looking at. And the idea is basically just to do this for many species, or as many species as you want to compare, and just to look at this fingerprint and see how similar they are between species. And so the more similar they are, the more uh, closely related those species are. And he came up with just a, a metric to calculate the similarity between uh, those fragments in different species. Um, and he used this to compare uh, a, a f dozen or 15 species uh, at the time, which was already huge. Um, and he wrote this paper uh, that came out in seven, 1977. And that was the first uh, molecular phylogeny uh, and that allowed us to discover what we still call the third domain of life. So in this paper, again, so they did use uh, the method I've just uh, explained, so to try to compare how similar the ribosomal RNA is between different species and to calculate, uh, to use this, this metric of how similar those RNAs are. 
And if you uh, look at those numbers a little closely, you can see that some species have uh, RNAs that are a lot more similar between themselves than uh, r relative to other species. So he found three major groups of organisms. Uh, and by looking at which those were, uh, he recognized that the first, uh, the first group contained basically what we already knew to be bacteria. Yeah, this was just sort of confirming what we already knew. So bacteria were very different from eukaryotes and they form a group. Uh, he found a second group that was basically corresponding to eukaryotes. So where he found plant, uh, fungi, and slime molds, so unicellular eukaryotes, so protists, that were all forming also a group. However, uh, he realized, or they realized in this paper, that you, uh, you bacteria, so bacteria, and eukaryotes d did not represent the entirety of uh, the diversity of life, and that by doing this metric, they could observe a third group of organisms. Uh, which in their, uh, yeah, in their species representation corresponded to, at the time, what we called methanogenic bacteria. Um, and uh, so bacteria that uh, were living in environments without oxygen uh, and that were generating methane. Um, and but from looking at their RNA, um, we could see that they were as different from bacteria, from more standard bacteria, than they were to eukaryotes. So they were something completely different from a genetic perspective. Uh, so they decided to, well, to consider them a different kingdom. So this was the third uh, or different domain of life. So this was the third domain of life. And because they had this sort of unusual metabolism that was based on so absence of oxygen generating methane uh, and this uh, made them think that this was well suited to uh, the type of environment that was supposed to exist on earth maybe three to four billion years ago so something very ancestral so that's why they call them archaea bacteria so archaea meaning old from now on, I will say archaea and not archaeobacteria, and I will uh, just come back to this in a second. But basically, the idea is that today we know they are not bacteria; they are completely, they are something completely different. So they are their own uh, domain of life, and they've been sort of re renamed, rebranded archaea alone, and not archaeobacteria to avoid any confusion. So for a very long time and because also this is how they were discovered uh, archaea were considered to be extremophiles so liking extreme environments and it's true that we do find them in very unusual environments so in environments with very high salt concentrations uh, very hot environments like the organisms able to live at the hottest uh, the highest temperatures are archaea and not bacteria um, they like uh, or they can like a very acidic environments or with very high levels of uh, different metals. So this sort of reshaping of the tree of life into now three domains and with animals and plants actually representing a very small corner of the diversity was not well accepted at the time. A lot of scientists uh, were upset <laughs> at the idea that multicellular organisms were actually a minority of life on Earth. Um, so there was a lot of uh, appraisal at the time about this result, but nonetheless, with time, this uh, we got to accept that this is uh, really what's representing uh, the diversity of life. So Woos continued uh, to apply this technique, and as we had access to a little more uh, different types of uh, organisms. So he reconstructed again using the same method uh, a tree of life and he re still recovered those three domains uh, that are now, so in 1990 he rebranded, so he renamed Archaebacteria into Archaea. So uh, I will talk now a little bit about the environmental sequencing. So as uh, you're probably familiar with but 
cellular life is old. <laughs> the origin, or we think that cellular life might have originated maybe as early as four billion years ago. Uh, eukaryotes maybe about two billion years ago. Uh, but multicellular life is actually like in comparison to all of this is quite recent. So maybe 800 million years, and maybe a little bit more. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's a recent multicellular li cellular life is a recent invention, um, and which means that the very vast majority of bi like of life, whether it's past or present, is microbial. And yeah, so microbial life dominates life on Earth. There's no no probably no surprise here. Um, it's uh, indispensable for uh, many good things, so nitrogen and carbon fi fixation, so those are key cycles of life uh, to produce energy that goes from inorganic to organic. That is done by, uh, by bacteria mostly uh, and some archaea, of course. Uh, also animal nutrition, so the fact that some termites are able to eat wood um, or the rumen of uh, cows, all of their digestion is, is made possible because they have uh, archaea for, uh, and bacteria in, in their gut. Uh, of course, there are bad <laughs> microbes, so uh, you might be familiar with like food poisoning, uh, of course, uh, Lyme disease, uh, bubonic plague. Uh, and there's a lot of unknown. So we're interested in microbial life because now uh, there's a lot of interest in what we call the microbiome. We know that we're covered in, uh, in prokaryotes uh, and other also, also microbial eukaryotes uh, in different parts of our body. And we know that affects us, but we're still not completely sure how. Uh, but we know that affects also even our uh, potentially our mental health. So there's a lot of interest uh, in microbial life because of, of this. Uh, microbes are also allowing us uh, to have access to delicious things uh, such as bread, uh, cheese, beer, uh, or to uh, also come up with uh, biofuels. Uh, all of this is being uh, made possible because of, of microbes. Uh, and also we are, have an interest in them because they live in very unusual environments. So as I've mentioned before, uh, maybe some like very uh, sulfurous, uh, very high acidity and very hot environments uh, or high salt environments. And so where scientists are trying to understand how this is possible and even there is a uh, scientist trying to, so there's this very nice documentary uh, of this expedition that was aimed, meant to sample very poly-extreme environments so that are both acidic and hot, for example, and to try to determine what are the limits of life. Where do you find life and where do you not find life and specifically microbial life. But to do this, well, until recently we were constrained by the fact that to study those microbes you need to grow them in the lab but growing or like even microbes in the lab is not trivial we don't always know what they need to grow properly uh, and we estimate that there's only about one percent of existing microbial life that we are able to culture uh, so far so how do we access the rest of the diversity? How do we study the remaining 99%? Well, um, this became possible thanks to a technique that was developed by Norm Pace. Uh, Norm Pace developed an approach that allows you to take a sample from the environment, a water sample, a soil sample, uh, and to extract the DNA directly from that sample. So you don't need to grow any cells, you just extract the DNA. Uh, and then you sequence it in a, well, in a, in a way that I will not develop here, but that allows you to really access, so this RNA, this ribosomal RNA that I've mentioned before, you can now access it, but directly from the environment instead of having to have cultures. And this, with this ribosomal RNA, we were able to do phylogeny just as, as I've shown you before, but now on a, such a much larger diversity of ribosomal RNAs that 
really showed us how much we were missing. So this is a tree that is from 2013. So it's already starting to be old now, but you can see on this tree that at the time, so all the, um, the, so this is a tree just of bacteria uh, and the organisms that the clades for which we had at least one cultured representative at the time are represented in white and everything else is, was only known from the environment, so from sequencing directly from the environment. So you can see how much we were missing by only accessing things in the lab. This is a similar tree, more recent, but for archaea. So similarly here, the dark green triangles are the ones for which we have cultured representatives. So everything else, the very vast majority of archaeal diversity is actually known only from the environment. As we started having access to more and more of this diversity and trying to understand the deep, the, what we call deep relationships, so ancient relationships between lineages uh, by using this, those phylogenies of 16S or the ribosomal RNA, we realized that this was actually quite difficult because uh, we're working with uh, one gene, one single gene, and we're trying to resolve all of those relationships. Uh, and the problem is that the only way you have to uh, evaluate how close species are or how distant they are is again by comparing this gene and see how similar it is between different species um, or how different it is. And you can have difficulties retracing uh, those relationships if you are in a situation where species or diff different lineages diverge very fast. So you've had a very short amount of time during which differences can be um, imprinted, registered in the molecule that you're looking at. Um, and, and or if this is combined with divergences that happened a very long time ago, then well, you might have had differences that allowed you to retrace those those relationships, but with time you can have what we call multiple uh, substitutions. So substitution mutations that happen over and over at the same site and so eventually the signal, the historical signal gets erased. Uh, a conclusion that trying to reconstruct a universal tree of life just based on this ribosomal RNA was actually uh, impossible or at least did not allow us to uh, really well resolve the deep relationships between organisms. Again, because we're working with one gene, so it's a limited number of characters. Um, you have multiple substitutions, what we also call saturation. Uh, so this leads to what we call poor resolution of those deep relationships. So try to overcome this, uh, we moved from being interested or looking at one gene to try to look at the entire genome of organisms. And this was made possible again, thanks to technological advances. Uh, so at the end of the 90s, we started uh, having access to whole genome sequencing. Uh, so the first bacteria, uh, bacterial genomes uh, were obtained in 1995, first archaeal genome in 1996. Um, the first yeast genome in the same year. And so from there on, having access to uh, more and more uh, entire genomes. And as always, this is, this, this is pretty exponential. So this is showing you the number of available genomes that were sequenced uh, for different domains of life. Uh, so archaea, bacteria, eukaryotes, uh, here also represented viruses. And uh, this is not to scale because now I've just updated with the number of genomes we have today and we have over 400,000 genomes, full genomes that are sequenced and available. So how does that help us? Well now, instead of using one gene that we can compare between species, we can try to use many genes. Uh, so which genes are we going to use? Well, if you look at any genome, you have more or less, we can classify the genes in this genome into three categories. So you have the core genes that uh, we're also called the housekeeping genes. Um, so this is really what is the key, the key 
functions of a cell. So anything that is related to uh, maintaining, repairing the DNA, uh, doing the expression of this genetic material, so replication, transcription, translation, uh, cell division, obviously. So those are such important genes that uh, you do tend to, well, you do expect them to be found in all cells uh, and to be conserved uh, across uh, distant, distantly related species. In contrast, you have what we call the flexible shell. Uh, so those are genes that will be more to do with how you're, how you're interacting with your environment. So what kind of nutrients you take in, how you process those nutrients, how you transport things in the cell, etc., and how you interact with your peers. Uh, so those are less well conserved. They're going to be more specific to the type of environments uh, of environment you're in. Um, and so they're more linked yeah, to the type of, to the, the phenotype you have, what kind of metabolism, what kind of nutrient you use and you need. And finally, you have orphan genes. So as their name suggests, so orphan genes are usually genes that we know very little about because they are not found in many species. They are found in a very restricted set of organisms. They tend to be involved in very recent adaptations to an environment. Um, and those are genes that tend to be gained and lost very fast in evolution. And so, of course, if you go back to our question, how do we build a tree of life? Well, which genes, which genes are we going to use if we're trying to compare many, like, very distant organisms? We're going to use the core genes, uh, because, again, you do expect them to be universally present. You expect them to be evolving slowly, again, because they are so important that they tend to be, to not be very flexible in terms of changes. Um, and they tend to, uh, to reflect the history of life. Like those genes are not something that you're just gonna exchange with some random organism that is in the environment. This is gonna be something that you inherit from your parent cell and her parent cell, etc. So those genes are going to really reflect the relationships uh, between organisms. So how many genes is that? Well, that's actually not so many. Uh, it's more better than one, but there's probably less than 100 genes that you do expect to find to be conserved across the entirety of life. Uh, and again, those genes uh, tend to be involved in what we call so those informational processes, so such as DNA maintenance uh, and expression. And so, for example, ribosomal proteins. So how do we do this? Like, how do we combine the signal for, from multiple genes? Well, maybe we'll start by how do we use the signal from a single gene? So we've talked a little bit about this earlier, but now we have access to uh, the actual sequence of genes in an organism. And so you can uh, compare the same gene in many species, again, see how similar they are or how different they are and try to, well, we have models to try to understand how they've evolved from an ancestral sequence in an ancestor, like a common ancestor and how this sequence has evolved and diverged in different species as the species evolved. So for example, here we have four species. Uh, we have the sequence corresponding to the same gene in those four species, so to an, a homologous gene. Uh, so here, uh, this works uh, like languages, so you can have the word for good morning in different species, and you can see they're similar, but they're not identical. And you can try to infer which character, which letter was inherited from the ancestral word. word. So for example, the G obviously is the same as everyone, so ancestrally that must have been a G. Um, now, after that, some species have two vowels, so two O's, or some only have one. So here you can infer that there's been either maybe a loss of one letter in some species, or there's been a gain of a letter in some species. And so you can do this, and doing this is what we call aligning the sequences. And then 
Well, sometimes you're not really sure uh, what has happened because maybe there's been a lot of changes and you're not sure which one, what was ancestral, what was not. Uh, so you're going to remove those noisy regions. So this is what we call site selection. So you're going to keep just the things for which you're sure that they're inherited from an ancestral character. And then once you have this, then you can look at the similarities between those sequences and then make inferences on the relationships of those species that carry those, those genes. So here in the end, we have the sequence in species two and species three, uh, three that are identical. So we are going to assume that those species are very closely related. Uh, in species one, you only have one difference, uh, whereas in species four, you have two differences with everything else. So we're going to assume that species four is the more distant uh, species. And when we do this with 100 genes, well, it's exactly the same. We just combine uh, all the genes with one another. We do the alignments, the site selection, and then you reconstruct a tree in the exact same way. Uh, the difference is just that now you have many, many, many more sites to work with. And so this is what people have done. Uh, the first uh, tree based on this concatenation, on this like super alignment, uh, was published in 2006. Uh, and so they use 40, uh, 31 universal proteins, so ribosomal proteins. Uh, and so in this tree, you can see at the time we had access to many more bacterial genomes than anything else. And uh, in this tree, what they could recover was in a way similar to the tree was had, except that it had many more species in it. Uh, and we have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. This tree, and as in the previous trees, archaea and eukaryotes seem to share uh, more, are more closely related to one another than they are to bacteria. Uh, so now I'm going to focus more specifically on the, place, on the placement of eukaryotes in the tree of life. Eukaryotic cells, and we've seen this before, they are very different from prokaryotic cells. They are much more complex. They have an intracellular organization uh, that is much more complex than what we find in bacteria and in archaea. Uh, they have a nucleus. Um, and they have, so they have uh, specificities, like uniqueness from, of eukaryotic cells, that is, this complex cellular features. But they also share some features with bacteria and they share some features with archaea. And this is why we often say that eukaryotes have a chimeric nature. One of the, for example, one very important feature that they share with bacteria is their membrane. So the, all cells are, uh, have a lipid membrane um, and the type of lipids uh, that you find in bacteria and in eukaryotes is the same and is very different from the one that we find in archaea. So I won't go into detail here, but they're just completely different types of lipids. Um, one key bacterial feature in eukaryotes are mitochondria. So eukaryotic cells have this compartment inside them that we often, to, often refer to as the powerhouse of the cell. This is where uh, most of the energy is being generated. Uh, but uh, not just only. Uh, there's also many other types of processes that take very important processes that take place in mitochondria. Uh, and this is, uh, all those processes are, are very similar to what happens in bacteria. And the reason for this is that mitochondria are actually, they are bacteria or they're descending from bacteria. So this is what we, uh, referred to as the endosymbiont theory. So the fact that mitochondria uh, and also chloroplasts in plants, so what allows for photosynthesis in plants, uh, it's another subcellular compartment, uh, used to be free living bacteria that were engulfed and sort of tamed and uh, turned into an organelle in eukaryotic cells. Uh, this is an old idea, actually. Uh, it was first proposed in 1890. It wasn't very well received at the time. It, like people thought that was a crazy idea. Um, but when we start accessing uh, molecular sequences and making phylogenies, uh, well, we realized, first of all, that mitochondria had DNA inside them. 
and that if you looked at this DNA and you tried to place it in a phylogenetic tree, this DNA fell in the middle of bacteria, and more specifically, in the middle of alpha proteobacteria. So this was the confirmation that mitochondria used to be bacteria. They, they were involved from an endosymbiosis, like an, an acquisition of an alpha proteobacterium. And today, uh, well, this still stands even with many, many more um, genomes that we have access to. People have redone phylogenies many times, and we still find this connection between the DNA that's uh, found in mitochondria and the DNA of alpha proteobacteria. Uh, we don't know exactly which lineage, if there was a specific lineage of alpha proteobacteria that gave rise to mitochondria, but nonetheless, we know this is a real connection. So we really have this view of the origin of eukaryotic cells as this host cell that engulfed an alpha proteobacterium that gave mitochondria. Okay, and now if we uh, are looking at the features that are shared, uh, so the other side of the chimeric nature of eukaryotes, so the features that are shared between archaea and eukaryotes. Uh, well, all of those features, or most of those features, tend to have to do with those informational processes. So again, DNA replication, transcription, translation. Um, many of the components of those informational systems are more similar between archaea and eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. Uh, and more than that, actually some of those components only exist in archaea and eukaryotes and don't exist in bacteria. Uh, here it's an example, so an RNA polymerase. Um, so just to show you, so you can see on the left uh, the structure of this complex in bacteria and how it's a lot more, like it's smaller, it's less complex than it is in archaea and eukaryotes. And you can see just from this structure that in archaea and eukaryotes, it looks very similar. And on the right side, uh, it's just the list of the different components. And you can see again that the ones that are shared between all three domains of life are a small subset uh, compared to what is shared uniquely between archaea and eukaryotes. So this is something that people have observed very early on when we started knowing that archaea existed. Uh, and so this connection between archaea and eukaryotes were, was suspect, this evolutionary connection was suspected very, uh, very early on. Uh, now the question was, well, but which archaea? Are eukaryotes specifically linked to a subgroup of archaea or are they just sister, what we call like a sister lineage to the entire domain of archaea? For a very long time, uh, until the mid-2000, uh, there was those two conflicting uh, theories that uh, eukaryotes, so eukaryotes were either a sister to, were an independent domain, they were sister to archaea, so this is what you can see on the right, uh, and this is uh, what people refer to as the three domain tree of life. Um, but there was also competing hypotheses that thought that maybe eukaryotes actually evolved from within archaea, like from a specific lineage of archaea. Uh, and so what, this is what you can see on the, on the left side. And this is what people call the two domain tree of life because there were two primary domains, so the bacteria and archaea, and then eukaryotes evolved from inside of archaea. And people were doing phylogenies and were getting conflicting results and where we're not really getting out of this uh, hole because people were always reanalyzing those few universal genes that I've mentioned before. Uh, but at the time from only this was pre-environmental uh, sequencing, so we had access to very few species. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of signal, a little, like not a lot of data to work with. Uh, and the models, the evolutionary models that we were using were still not very sophisticated and so we were getting just conflicting results. However, if we're ignoring the phylogenies but we're just looking at characters, features, um, there was something so that appeared. So here at the top are listed a number of uh, genes that for a long time were thought to be unique to eukaryotes. Uh, and if not unique, that are very important for the function of eukaryotic cells. And then when people have uh, 
looked for homologs of those genes in archaea, what they found, uh, so this is what you can see with those filled circles, uh, what you can see is that, well, it's not a very clear signal, but you can see that there is a clay, like a very big group of archaea, so the TAC archaea, tend to share more characters with eukaryotes than the rest of archaea. They have homologs for all of, uh, or for many of those uh, eukaryotic signature genes. Um, so more of those are found in Tacharchia than in Uriarchiota. And so because of this, and because we were sometimes getting this in phylogenies also, uh, it really started to be accepted that maybe eukaryotes really do come from inside Archaea, and maybe more specifically sister to Tacharchia, but this wasn't completely clear. Uh, it became a lot clearer thanks to uh, metagenomics, so environmental sequencing, so the access to genomes directly from the environment. And in 2015, um, so really quite recently, uh, those methods allowed us to have access uh, to a completely new phylum uh, or superphylum of archaea, so an, a very large group of archaea that we did not know so far. Uh, and for which we had now access to their entire genome. And when we placed, uh, so the first genome uh, was found uh, in uh, sediments uh, near what we call the, well, what is called the Loki's castle. Um, and because of this, the very first representative, so this first genome was uh, called Loki Archaeota. After that, we started having more genomes represent, like, and understanding how diverse this group was. They all have, uh, because the first one was Loki Archaeota, and that's a Norse uh, mythology god, all of them have names after uh, Norse gods um, that you can see here. But long story short, if we now included those organisms in the phylogenies, now the signal was a lot more clear and we can see that eukaryotes actually branch not only from inside archaea but actually from inside Asgard archaea. Um, so this, is, this was really a revolution, this was a breakthrough uh, when it comes to understanding uh, the tree of life and the origin of eukaryotes. And this is, yeah, this was a paper that was published in 2017. And now when we looked at those genomes, and if we're thinking back of those eukaryotic signature genes or signature proteins, and we're updating this, this presence-absence table, well, what we can see is that there, those Asgard archaea have many, many, many more uh, homologs of those eukaryotic signature genes than any other lineage of archaea, which was a, like a an independent but additional evidence for the connection between those archaea and eukaryotes. Uh, and I'll just finish by saying that while well, all of this was made possible by metagenomics, uh, but we now have the culture of the first representative of those Asgard archaea, uh, and they show that those archaea are, like from a morphological point of view, they are really quite unusual and complex, which would fit well with the fact that they tend to encode uh, more eukaryotic-like genes, and in particular genes that have to do with cytoskeleton and yeah, cell morphology and, and trafficking. Uh, nonetheless, they remain, they are archaea, they're not some hybrid organism. Uh, they are small cells, uh, and they do not seem to have any internal complexity like eukaryotic cells. We're starting to have a clear understanding of the connection between archaea and eukaryotes. We also know for sure that mitochondria evolved from bacteria. So there is uh, evidence uh, for a fusion event at the origin of eukaryotes. Um, so that involved an archaeal derived cell and uh, an alpha proteobacterial cell. There's a lot of missing questions, uh, missing answers. Uh, to the origin of eukaryotes and how the tree of life uh, came to be the way it is now, uh, which is, well, we know there's a connection to Asgard's, we still don't know exactly which lineage. Um, same for the mitochondria, we know that they were related to alpha proteobacteria, but we're not really sure which ones. 
Uh, we don't know yet what was the interaction, uh, what was the, the driver for this interaction between those two cells that led to this endosymbiosis. Um, and how did this complexification happen? In which order, what, again, what drove this complexification of the cellular compartmentation? Uh, and was there any role of viruses in, in the origin of eukaryotes? So th those are all uh, pieces of the puzzle that people are currently working on to better understand how eukaryotes came to be and how the tree of life uh, really looks like. Thank you.